Hi. No, are you, do you guys get the hello routine today? Hello. I don't know why you say goodbye. I say hello. <laughs> okay, that wasn't even in tune. That was horrible. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, well, whatever. So, hi, I'm James Gall, uh, Encounters Network, getting ready uh, at the f this new year on rebranding and new website and integration, a lot of things. And so, I had a dream. Uh, so, my birthright name is actually Jimmy. And I grew up as then in high school and college as Jim. Some of you know me as that. And then when I turned 50, I asked my mother if I, I wanted to change my name to James legally. <clears throat> and so I asked her about that, and it was really on the inside of me. I'd prayed about it for a long time, and my mom looks at me. My dad was already in heaven, and my mom says, I was afraid it was I was going to offend her, you know. And she says, well, of course. <laughs> she said, you were supposed to have been named James on your birth certificate anyway. And she said, she told me the story then. She said, because uh, my dad was the oldest of seven, and he had a, a brother named James Eldon. Well, my mom and daddy was World War II, you know, anyway, whatever. It was called, so in that period of time, it was called uh, the War Brides. And so I never could figure out how my mommy and my daddy got together. So as a child, I asked my mama one time, <laughs> I'm all over the map already. Jesus, pull me in. Okay. <laughs> I think I need to pray again. And my mama told me, she says, oh, it, I mean, I will always, this is seared on the inside of me. Oh, it was your daddy's blue eyes. Well, my dad did have really good-looking blue eyes. And guess what? So do I. Oh, okay. Don't forget that. <laughs> that was bad. So and I turned to my mom, and I asked her, you know, on my 50th birthday, I'm 64 now. I'll be 65 this July. And I'm getting younger, by the way. And, and, uh, and so I asked my mom about, on my 50th birthday, I would like to do a, have a birthday present and legally change my name to James. And then she tells me, says, well, of course, you were supposed to have been named James anyway. After your uncle, who gave us the $20 to be able to run off and get married. <laughs> you know, buy a, buy a, not a driver's license, but, you know, a wedding license and whatever. And so, and, but the doctor, I was a home birth, at the doctor asked, what are you going to call him, not name him? And so my mom and dad thought that he, he was a reference to like a nickname. So they said, oh, we'll call him Jimmy. So my name then got put on my birth certificate as Jimmy. But anyway, that's all been changed. <laughs> and yes, I am a parable. Because guess what? At 50, I changed. At 50, I went through a name change. Because I felt that there was actually a ceiling over my head. I won't explain all of that. And I needed that ceiling changed. Because I was actually being shaped and formed for a people that I did not yet know. And the name James carries more weight. And so I knew that I was supposed to do something in the natural in an act of preparation to be able to have an audience with the people that I did not yet know. So the reason I'm partially telling it, it deals with the Jubilee, the fifty. Remember, and Stacy, and Che and I, and, and all of us has just been, what a wonderful tapestry. 
because I shared about the 500 years of the Great Reformation. I talked about the 70 years of, of when legally the UN uh, was um, formed and, excuse me, acknowledged the birth uh, of the right for the nation of Israel, 50 years of United Jerusalem, 50 years of the, uh, and Stacy did a correct uh, uh, branding on uh, what I stated, the Catholic charismatic movement, and then I wove into that then that there were actually three streams that came forth at the same time of the Catholic charismatic, the Jesus people, and the Messianic movement. And we are at, again, you see, that jubilee period in church history. That, folks, I, now, okay, just in case you don't really grasp, understand this, seriously, I, I'm not trying to be hyped, and I'm not trying to be hyper. Sometimes I just am. And then sometimes I'm a little more mellow. And, but I do not really remember a year. You know, I'm known as a seer because I wrote the book. <laughs> and because I did historical research and I walked with the seers. So I'm known as a seer. But my strongest suit is the feeler. So one of the books that I am finishing editing on right now is called The Discerner. And that will come out this fall. One of my best books I will have ever written will come out in the spring called The Lifestyle of a Watchman. It is, I just wept when I reread the manuscript. And I don't think I've ever done anything It's more substantive than this and it's the sequel to the lifestyle of a prophet so anyway i god gave me a grace to write i not schooled in it though at the same time you know god schools you So anyway, so here's a couple of things I just want to quickly give away. This is Living a Supernatural Life. I love this book. Okay, hi. And uh, it's as much about, su I call it supernatural character as it is supernatural gifting. And I talk about both sides of the cross. And then this is my finding hope. And I actually kind of want to rebrand it a little bit. And I want to go from finding hope to irresistible hope, Okay. But there's a big part of my life message of recent years is there in that particular book. Okay, and so uh, and then the 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 two newest books they're um, sold out for this particular conference. Release uh, hearing God's voice today and releasing spiritual gifts today. And so why don't you just stand one more time and pray with me? And um, and I'm. You might not understand what I'm doing here. I'm going to pull a Jill Austin. I'm going to arrange the furniture. And, and I might arrange some of you. And I don't know, how, you know, or I might say fire. And, and then it's all over, you know. <laughs> okay. But I actually have some uh, stories to tell you today. Father, thank you <laughs> for such a time as this. I am so much in anticipation and in an expectation for what is and what will be and what is about to crash in upon us. There's a difference between revelation and having a voice that can be heard. And I've pondered for years in my early growing up in the prophetic movement, having been all those many years ago in the incubation bed of, in 1988, with Paul Kane and Bob Jones and John Paul Jackson and the like, and I was numbered amongst them. I was one of seven leaders. It wasn't that there weren't others. There were many, many, many other prophets in the land and in the world, 
But there were seven that John Wimber, a messenger of the third wave movement, recognized as prophets. I was one of those seven that John Wimber recognized as a prophet in that late 80s, in the early, in the early 1990s, pre-Toronto. And I had a dream two years ago. I wasn't able to go on the HIM Apostolic Team Retreat this last year because of pain, back surgery. But I'm here this year. <laughs> and two years ago, I was there. And I don't know if Stacy is in the room or not. They've left. But Stacy Campbell wrecked me. Because we always have a time of praying and prophesying over one another. And Stacy prophesied something over me. And sometimes when people say things, I listen, but it just doesn't quite sink in. I have a, Kyle, a file called pending. Okay, I know I went from praying to explaining. And, and I have a file called pending, and I don't say no to something. I don't always say yes to something. I put it in my file cabinet, spiritual, called pending. Because God will confirm his word by the witness of two and three. You're not supposed to buy into everything the first time you hear it. You do that. Uh, mm, uh, mm, I might. Mm, I, I, you know what? I'm actually, I'm really here to help you today. I'm not only here to teach you today. I'm here to help, help us today. I want to speak in a little bit different way with you today. So two, two years ago, I was on the HIM team gathering, and Stacy Campbell prophesied over me, and it kind of messed with me. You know when something, it doesn't just like go in you, it messes with you. Like, I don't know where Garland went, but I hope that word messed with him. <laughs> I don't know if that was on his mommy's side or not, but I know it's on his daddy's side. You know, so wherever Garland went, dude, you better, wherever he is, I don't care if he's in the room right now or not. Okay, so listen, you guys better start choreographing some dance. I mean it. He's, he, listen, the apostle of the house just said it, but I'm telling you, I've been seeing it. I've been praying about that whole Bethel kids thing, you know. I live in Nashville, folks. I'm all over the map. Jesus have mercy. Where the musicians live. I go to this amazing church right now where it's like the who's who of the music industry. At us where they're at. Okay, and it's absolutely astounding. It's amazing. And the honor I get, you know, just being around, it's just absolutely crazy. And there's an actual finger of God that's coming down in the middle of Nashville, Tennessee, at a place called Rocket Town. And I am seeing with my own eyes, every time I'm there, anywhere from 10 to 30 young people come to Jesus in every service. And, and movers and shakers are there. And the Lord sent me to heaven and a year and a half ago, and I went to heaven, and he started talking to me about different people that I didn't even know. And he started talking to me about that he preserved me because he wanted me to be able to see with my own eyes the answer to my prayers. The rebirth of a Jesus people movement. And I am watching with my own eyes right now. It is the closest thing that I've ever seen in the earth today of a next generation Jesus people DNA. It's like freaking awesome. <laughs> and I get to, and you know, it's like I get to even help them how to dress. You know? <laughs> I got my bomber jacket on and you know, in some kind of Maddox shoes. I don't remember what they are, you know. Know, what are, you know Madden, mood, mood, whatever. It's like, come on. Come, it's like, I don't, Jesus have mercy on me. Surely will die. Okay, so. <laughs> so Stacy wrecked me because of something's prophesied. I'm going to tell you what it was. And I went to God that night on that cruise. And I told God, I said, listen, I mean, I, 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 I like, Sometimes I do the, like the, uh, the holy prayer stuff, you know, and, and I do the word prayer, and then I do the gutsy prayer. You know, the raw, real, get in, get in his face praying. Do you understand what I'm rambling about? And I just kind of just like, look, listen, you. 
You remember who I am? You remember my name? You know my address or not? I'm serious. You know what? That will offend him the least bit. He actually kind of likes it. No, <laughs> I would recommend also doing the word praying and, and uh, hallowed be thy name and, and, you know, praise and thanksgiving as well. But God really, I'm gonna, hey, I'm going to give you a word right now. Get in God's face. You want to give somebody a word? Give God a word. Get, get in God's face and give God a word. That night, two years ago, I got in God's face and I said, hey, you listen. That word messed with me. Do you understand what that word did to me? Well, you don't understand because you don't know what the word was. <laughs> it don't make any difference. But I hope God does something in your life that just rattles your cage so much it might touch a raw nerve ah, and cause you to go get in his face. So I got it in his face and I said, you listen to me. If that word is of you, I need you to confirm it because it really messed. I mean, most words, it's like, but that one like uh, got me. All right. Just got me. And so I prayed like that. Guess what? I had a dream. <laughs> crystal clear dream that morning. Absolute crystal clear dream. John Paul Jackson came and stood before me. He was still alive at that time. Paul Cain came and stood before me. Our word of the Lord came to me. From heaven. And the presence of God invaded that little cruise room. <laughs> and he more than confirmed. The voice of God direct more than confirmed what Stacy had prophesied to me. So with that in mind, and I didn't tell you the word, because there are some things are secrets, and then you live them out, and then you live them out. There are secrets, and then when you live them out, everybody knows your secrets. Because then they get shouted from the housetop. And then it's not self promotion. See? Because then your identity is hidden with Christ in God. And it's not about you. It really, it really, it really really is about him. Okay, Father, thank you. Help me right now to redeem this time. And I thank you and bless if these people have socks on, blow their socks off. <laughs> Amen. I might just take my socks off. Okay, no. <laughs> oh, okay, I won't. Okay, so what I'm going to try to share with you after that animated uh, introduction. Um, <clears throat> I had a dream on, what morning was it? Sunday morning, I guess it was. Is this the 17th or 16th? 16th. So I had it, I don't know, okay. Yes, this is Monday. I had it yesterday. By the way, I'm so grateful that the Paris Accord, if you don't understand what that was, it went flat. <laughs> Uh, yes, it did. And we declared right here it would. <laughs> Seventy nations gathered together. They didn't pass a stinking thing. Mm -mm. 
It did not, and there was infighting, just like we, we declared. We declared it right here. The authority of God came on them, and I declared there would be infighting, and they would not come out because there was a plot to pass a, uh, an agreement and then it, to get snuck through the, United, uh, the Security Council of the United Nations today on Martin Luther King's as we celebrate that civil rights hero of peace. So anyway, I just wanted you to know that declaration in the anointing works. Uh, all right. So I had a dream. I guess it was Sunday morning. And, um, and it was like this. Here's the dream. And the word of the Lord came to me and said this. We have had a purpose-driven life and now a presence-motivated people. But we need values-anchored believers. I will say that one more time. I mean, I heard this in a dream. We have a purpose we have had, and, and, and he was in favor of all of these things, folks, okay? He was, there was, wasn't comparison and then like putting something down, but watch this. He said, we have had a purpose-driven life, and now a presence-motivated people, but what we need is values-anchored believers, Values anchored believers. So I'm going to try to talk about that. And he even gave me, in the dream, the scripture to begin with. Matthew 7. That's familiar to almost all of us. Matthew 7, verse 24. Therefore, Everyone who hears these words of mine, these are the words of Jesus, and acts on them. Huh? What? Everyone who hears, would you say this with me? Everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them. Novel idea. Okay. Jesus said, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man. How many here want to be a wise man or woman? Whatever your eschatology is, okay? <laughs> I would like to talk about that one too. But God is looking for people. Who will be pillars in the house of God. God is looking for people who will weather storms. God is looking for people who are overcomers. And you know what? The world is looking for people who weather storms. The world is looking for people who aren't victims but have a victorious mindset. So let's read, because this was the dream. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell. The floods came. The winds blew. I love this. Now I'm reading from the New International, whatever, New, New American Standard, you know, Bible. And so I don't know what the pastor translation reads on this, but I like this. Okay. And the winds blew and slammed. Ha ha. You want to smile at me right now? <laughs> These are the words of Jesus. You're not smiling. <laughs> and it's, sl say slammed. 
Say slam and jam in Jesus. This is slam and jam in Jesus. Because he says that everybody who hears. Oh, okay, all right. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew <laughs> and slammed against that house. Yet it did not fall. For it had been founded on the rock. It did not fall. It did not fall. Oh, okay. Verse 26. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell. The floods came. What you saying, Jesus? What you, what you mean, Matthew? Just sounds like you're repeating the same verse. Huh? Watch. The rain fell. The floods came. The winds blew. And what? And slammed. Bam. <laughs> slammed. Oh, my gosh. Wait, wait, wait. I, I, I rebuke that in the name of God. But what if the slamming is Jesus? Well, <laughs> yeah, well, I've done a lot of that too. Okay. Everyone who hears these words of mine, verse 26, and does not act on them will be a foolish man. And he's built his houses on sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, slammed against that house, and it fell. And great was its fall. I like verse 24 and 25 better. Ha <laughs> The rain fell, verse 25, the floods came. Dude, sounds like verse 27. It is. And the winds blew, verse 27, and slammed against the house, like verse 27. And yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. We find a parallel of this then in Luke chapter 7, verse 46 to 49. And so in the dream, what came to me was, again, we have had purpose-driven people. We now have presence-motivated. We, we've, we've had purpose-driven life. We now have presence-motivated people, and we need values-anchored believers. Now, the word anchor is also used in the Scriptures and other, other places. One of the key places is Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19, where it defines it, and I do teach about that in this book on finding hope. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul. I like that. It's extremely interesting. It's this hope. Hope is the positive expectation of good. Something good is just about to happen. And we remember we put on the helmet of salvation, but 1 Thessalonians 5.8 says it is the helmet of hope of salvation. So we have to filter what we listen to, and it determines what we think through hope, that something good is just about to happen. But a lot of us, through circumstances and through um, generational issues or wrong teachings in church, etc., we are we do not have our helmet of hope on and so what comes in then is not filtered through hope and then it develops what then in restoring the foundations understandings and many other healing uh, integrated healing approaches is called ungodly beliefs and we are to bring every thought every and these are strongholds here we've warred against the strongholds there well we first have to win the battle here and when we win the battle here, we grow in our actualized authority over all power and authority. And Jesus said, the God of this world is coming and he has nothing in common with me. So we have, must remove what 
there could be common ground with the enemy. And when we remove that common ground, we have actualized, not just positional authority, we have actualized authority over that area and sphere of dominion, to take dominion. Uh, Did you understand that? Okay, thank you. So the hope, the positive expectation, anchor is is hope. This hope we have as an anchor of what? Of the soul. Because what does the soul do? Mind, will, emotions. I mean, it goes like this sometimes. Or yours doesn't. God bless you. What a boring life that would be. Ugh. God has emotions. I love emotions. I love getting excited. It's awesome. I mean, it is so, it is so wonderful to be happy. I mean, it's like, wow, what a great idea that God invented emotions. Wow. It's like, ah. Okay. But it's, hope is an anchor of the soul. And we drop the anchor. Okay. Hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil where Jesus is entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Values anchored believers. So we drop the anchor from our boat through the sea of uncertain circumstances of life, to be dropped to the bottom of the ocean to the solid rock below. And then we are immovable, unshakable, and we can pass through any storm. Oh, come on, that's pretty good. I like that. Yeah. So, I have had values pretty well established in my life for a long time. This man right here on the front row has had values, core values. I live out of core values. Some of you don't even know what that yours are, and you've never established them. Some of you don't know what biblical core values are. I'm going to tell you... There are absolutes in life. Now, there are some things that you need to be a little, you know, flexible on, okay? But there are core values. There are some things that are absolutes. Do you have some absolute values? I'm going to tell you something. I do. And if I had not, I don't know what condition I would be in today. Job says he swore to his own pain. Well, I have to. Then I'm not quitting. Because I have some core values. So I want to share with you about what are some of my core values. Because I had a dream that told me to do this. (laughs) And because this is a part of, uh, this conference is called something like, I have a destiny. Prophetic destiny. Well, if you want to fulfill your prophetic destiny, you need to discover what's your core values and live out of them because there will be temptations, there will be things that will come to try to move you, and if you don't have those established, and if you're not making your decisions based out, and those are already established, and then you're just going to be like as though, oh, it's like, well, i got to make a decision about something I've never decided before. No, not if you have your core values established, and then you bring that, and of course, that's in accordance with the Word of God, and then you go, oh, well, no, I was like, no, I don't know, that 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 doesn't even have a place in me. That doesn't even have a lure on me. That doesn't even have a draw on me. Because I'm living out of my core values. Folks, I've had a lot of cave time. I've had a lot. Okay. 
I've had a lot of time alone. And you understand what a lot of men do or people do when they got a lot of time alone? <laughs> okay. Some things that are not within biblical core values. But I made a decision a long time ago. I made a decision a long time ago that I was going to be a man of moral character. Uh -huh. And you know, when a lot of people get uh, hard times or go get into pain or whatever, they go to medicate themselves. Oh, my gosh. I had some dreams about this and about what people do to go, med how they go to medicate themselves. And, and, and he explained to me that there comes times in people's lives where we become tested, whether we are going to return to the things that entertained us in the past, or if we're going to live out of that anchor of those core values. And so, okay, let me just keep going and hi. Does this connect with anybody? Okay. Because I want you, get this, to finish well. I, this man, whatever God has in front of me, I don't want to go out like a fading star that once had like a blimp on the screen and was like a hot shot for Jesus. I want to go out passionate, on fire for God, living in moral integrity <laughs> by grace. I am not by any way trying to present myself up here as a person of perfection, but I am going to say to you, I walk in moral integrity. And I have walked in moral integrity all my life. Okay? By the grace of God. By the grace of God. Now, okay, let me address something. Huh. Well, what if I decide to remarry? In my business and not yours. <laughs> okay? And if he and I decide so, guess what? It'll be upright and holy and awesome. <laughs> because the first time was upright, holy, and awesome. How's that? And it's going to be anchored within the veil. Because I have an anchor to my soul. Well, I was numbered amongst the Kansas City prophets. Man, that was awesome and amazing. And I could go, yeah, wasn't that great? I got to be a part of church history. And then go, yeah, well, that was then and this is now. And I don't know if I'll ever be able to get to be a part of something on the cutting edge again or not. And, you know, but, but it really was a nice thing to be able to, like, help pioneer. But I don't really know. I mean, you know, after all, I mean, you know, it's like, you know, one time, two times. I mean, it's like, you know, you only get one opportunity in life. No, do you understand? No, 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 no. Because you want to know what one of my core values is? The best is yet to come. I mean, it is. I fight for that one, by the way. But I believe it in here. I absolutely believe it in here. I haven't always. It's been, it's been hard to believe that one. Uh -huh. Yes, it has. I'm telling you the truth. Because what? Winds and waves and floods and slamming, jamming. And then a little bit of demonic influence gets thrown in there whenever you go through those transitions. And the devil tries to take advantage of that. But I'm going to tell you, it's like, boom. It's like, because... You know what? There's something called the WWW. And it's not the World Wide Wrestlers. And it's not the World Wide Web. Do you know what the original WWW is? <laughs> Hi, Andy. <laughs> the Word, the Will, and the Ways of God. 
and I am in pursuit of the word, the will, and the ways of God. I have been a student of this. I have sought God after this. And guess what? I'm still seeking God to walk in the fullness of his word, his will, and discerning and walking in, not chiding against, but cooperating with the ways of God. So, Someone who's had some influence in my lives, my life, my lives. <laughs> Sometimes I do feel like I've already lived three. Actually, I'm on my fourth. Uh, uh, I almost died three, four times. But one of the people that has really has been used to impact my life in the recent years, one of them was C. Peter Wagner. Not as much as Che, and maybe Cindy and Chuck. But I was a part of the original group with the Apostolic Council of Prophetic Elders. And I was there in the original, the first National School of the Prophets, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I've had the privilege. I didn't go to Fuller Seminary and get to sit in those missiology classes like my friend and trusted brother, Che. But I had didn't have the privilege of reading his books and being around him and, and being able to talk with him. And I don't know that I have ever met, there's only maybe three people I have ever met that reached that kind of age and still had that level of childlike heart. Absolutely. That is the primary thing that I, I, I saw in that man. It was He was a constant pioneer. He never stopped pioneering. I'm so inspired by that. So I'm not going to be one of those that says, well, I was, one. I was once a Kansas City prophet. And now, hi, I'm backslidden now. And No, I mean, and, like, and you know, I was once a part of a move of God. And, and then we go to false comfort zones. Oh, oh, yeah. And we go to false comfort zones because maybe there's a cost to spend three freaking, I mean, three awesome years of nightly meetings <laughs> and maybe have adrenal burnout and you don't even know it. <laughs> and birth an international, one of the largest, fastest growing at new apostolic reformation movements in the world. I said one of them. I didn't say the. Huh. I wonder where that kind of stuff, multiplication, knowing like that comes from. It comes from being in the womb of his presence. So one of the people, Peter Wagner, and another one of the people that really has uh, delightfully impacted me in recent years has been Bill Johnson. I made a list of the 10 people that have impacted my life the most, and, and now I'm not sure what to do because Bill Johnson, I think, has just knocked one of those top 10 out, and so I don't know, my top 10 is now in 11, I'm not sure, I'm just like, but I don't want to knock one of those people out because I love them so much and I honor them, and my mama's one of them, and I can't knock her out. I mean, and Derek Prince is there, so I mean, it was like, whoa, you know. <laughs> you got Bob Jones, too. Hi, Bob. Okay, so you mean, I was like, I don't know, Bill, where you're going, but it's like, you know, you, you go, like, well, okay, you got it. By the way, I like to be animated, okay? Did you notice? I have a daughter that's an actress. <laughs> so, Bill Johnson, some of his, um, it's more who he is. Then he's king of pause approach of preaching. 
I analyze the way people talk and their approach and all of it. And I'm also a life language, a communications trainer, and I do it with businesses and stuff. And I watch that man, and I watch him in the spirit realm, and then I watch his style of approach. It's, it's really amazing. Talks. You're blown away by a phrase. He stands there. <laughs> totally unemotional. <laughs> with his hair blown back like Moses. <laughs> and then he drops another payload on you. And you're writing it down, and he's pausing long enough for you to try to, like, assimilate something that you just, he just bombed on you. And then he pauses again. He's like, dude, I'm going to learn how to do that. But anyway, <laughs> oh, God, have mercy on me. Oh, my God, my time's almost gone. I haven't even given you my values. So, here. And then I go to Speedy Gonzalez, okay? Page 28 and 29. Okay, thank you. What are my core values? I'm glad you asked. In order to learn to hope again, I had to go back to my ABCs, to my foundations. What did it matter that I was a professional minister who had traveled the globe and ministered in over 50 nations and had written over 40 books? I had to start back at the bottom. I had to figure, I figured out Three core values. One, God is good all the time, period. Mm -hmm. Two, all things work together for good. For those who love God have been called according to his purpose, Romans 8, 28. Number two, core value. I literally spent some years, and I let God jackhammer up the foundation, and inspect it and relay it if needed. And I found, and I rediscovered, rediscovered three core values that have guided my life. One, God is good. And I will tell you, that one has been amplified and renewed in me through the life and ministry of Bill Johnson. That God is good, period. Number two, that all things work together for okay. <clears throat> all things work together for good. For those who love God have been called to his purpose. I call it the mystery and the majesty of God. So that puts me in the divine tension between Calvinism and Ar Armenianism. So I've said for years anyway, I'm like, Calmenian. <laughs> hmm. I figured out three core values. One, that God is good all the time. Two, that all things work together for good for those who love God and been called according to his purpose. And number three, something good is just about to happen. Number three was actually a logical conclusion of number one and two. But it's a very important conclusion to come to. It's like one plus one equals five million. That's what this does. If God's good all the time. Thank you. That man said it makes sense. Thank you. This is very cerebral right now. <laughs> Elementary cerebral. If God is good all the time. Hey, listen. Does anybody here want to agree with me that God's good all the time? No matter what? No matter what winds or waves or slamming, jamming Jesus? Even his slamming. Do you know what? Jesus slams really good. I like to do a, like maybe do a song on that one, okay? And so the number three, I mean, I really worked on this. Number three, that something good is just about to happen. I believe it. 
Number one, God is good all the time. It's not just a catchphrase. I read the Bible from the front to the back all over again, and it convinced me that God does not make mistakes. He loves me. In fact, he loves everybody. He knows what he's doing. We have just to, we have to believe in that. Even when we are feeling as if the very life has been snuffed out of us. All things work together for good. That scriptural advice has too often been used glibly by people who feel they must have something helpful in the face of tragedy. But the fact is that it has been overused does not invalidate it. This is not to say that everything that happens is good. But if you continue to walk with God, he will take your broken pieces and supernaturally mend them. And that is an absolute miracle. With him, hope is on the way. Something good is just about to happen. No one seems to follow logically with the other two. How in the world can so much tragedy work out for good? I don't know. But God does. Who can bring light to this dark night of my soul? Only he can, and he does. Ha! Ah, you light up my life. Ah, you bring me hope to carry on. Okay, enough of that. One, God is good. So we must dream big. Two, nothing is impossible. These are core values. One, God is good, so we must dream big. Number two, nothing is impossible. Your yesterday's risk become today's lifestyle. Three, everything was purchased at Calvary. Everything was purchased at Calvary. I mean, these are my these are core values, folks. I have like lived by this. God's good, so we must dream big. Two, nothing is impossible. So yesterday's risk become my today's lifestyle. Three, everything was purchased at Calvary. So I owe him my trust when everything looks bad. Four, I am and you are significant. I must serve well. Out of the awareness of unlimited resources. Because I do not serve a king of lack. I am aligned with the king of abundant supply mercy okay some years ago in trying to help my kids in establishing uh how to make decisions and boundaries and things of this nature and i was never the type of parent that just gave black white answers and my kids would always want you know that that's what you think you're supposed to do well i believe when they're young yes that is the case uh two three years ago i did a session with my oldest son on uh, about parenting in the prophetic and it was really it was amazing uh, time and then the then two years ago I followed up then with my youngest daughter then on the uh, prophetic synergy of the generations and then we talked again and told amazing stories then about growing up in the culture of the supernatural going through tests boundaries and things of that nature and then she stepped to the to the platform here and she asked everybody here she said how many of you want to have a better relationship with your father because we were just walking that out and about half the people just broke out into tears and and she prayed for for you or whoever to uh, to that she said i want to have a better relationship with my dad and and then and then she prayed for all of you and then it was amazing i'm just there st sitting on the stool just watching this and loving it and then she comes over and she threw herself in front of everybody threw herself into my arms. Somebody took pictures. Somebody did a watercolor of that, and it is stunning, amazing, and accurate. Whoever you are, God bless you. I have it. It's a keepsake. 
Why am I telling you that? I'm going to tell you a real quick story, and then I'm going to pray for some mantles to be released real fast. One, I'm going to tell you, that. I have to at least tell you this story. My youngest daughter, Rachel, won when she was around 17 and a half to 18 years old. She won uh, Best Actress and Runner-Up Top Model at a national level uh, model and talent uh, competition in Orlando, Florida. And in that time, then, she was invited to go to uh, New York City. She was just 18 years old. Her mother was very sick, and I was in the middle of going through my second round of cancer. And she was invited at eight, not even 18 years old to for just like a, 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 a summer kind of a, a, a schooling at the New York Conservatory of Dramatic Arts. And so then from there, that became their pool, and it was a scholarship. And then from there, that was the pool that they used to then invite the students then who they wanted then to be actually a part of their uh, conservatory. So she's home for three days. I take her, to, and she gets a phone call saying that they wanted her to come be a part of the school, and she had a scholarship for it. I take her to the hospital, have her mom laid her hands on her, and her mother sent her to New York City with her blessing. And that was the last time she saw her mom. Rachel calls me on the phone because she's now in the middle of acting classes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and she's obviously running with the, um, uh, the rich kids with gold spoons in their mouth, but also very talented, amazing. And, but so this is very simple. Okay, very simple. And I'm going to tell you, finish this. I'm going to pray real fast for some mantles to be released because it's time. And so listen. So the teacher wants her to cuss. Well, she's never cussed in her life. In fact, she'd never heard a cuss word in the home. And so in the script, the teacher, the professor, wanted her to cuss. It was just part of acting classes, you know. But she wasn't sure about this. So she calls me on the phone. She says, Dad, what? what I mean, they, they want me to cuss in this class. I mean, that, this might sound like ABC to you, okay? But to us, it wasn't. And so then how am I going to answer her? Just yes, no, black, white? No, that isn't the way I raised my kids. I taught my kids how to make decisions. So what I did was I said, hey, Rachel, here's the deal. The first time you move your boundary, it's a whole lot easier to move it the second and the third time. So always be careful when you move your boundary the first time. So I didn't tell her yet. I gave her a principle of wisdom. You got it? So she prayed about it, and then her brother is a dreamer of dreams that are literal. And she thinks that I've talked to her brother Tyler, and I hadn't. And Tyler has a dream that she came home, and she was smoking, and she was cussing. She was a cussing of Blue Street. And so call, Tyler calls her up on the phone and says, Rachel, I don't know what you're doing, but whatever you're thinking about doing, don't do it because it'll change who you are. And she says, wait, Tyler, have you talked to dad? No. What you talking about? Because da 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 So what did she do? She went to her teacher, her professor, and she said, I can't do this. She did it at the risk of being kicked out of the school. And she said, I can't do this. And the teacher said, okay. He had no, she had no idea what was going to happen. A few days later in the class, the teacher in front of all of the students points her out and says, Rachel here has made a decision that it's not within her moral compass, her core values, to cuss. Is there anybody here that would feel the same way and that they, don't, they, they just can't, it would violate their conscience to do this script? And some of the other students raised their hand. And he let them, all that raises their hand, change the script. Simple, no, profound. Because you're living, oh, I'm sorry. you're living out of core values. You're living out of core values. Okay. All right. Stand up. <laughs> so core values, the word of God is my anchor. I worship God with my questions. I do not doubt in darkness what God has spoken in the light. I create a safe house by walking within moral boundaries, and I believe the best is yet to come. And now I'm going to real fast, I'm going to pray for two or three mantles to be released right now. 
because I got some other things I want to do, and I'm going to keep on doing what I'm doing, but I got a whole bunch of other things I want to do, so I'm going to release some things to you so I can move on, all right? <laughs> I declare over you today in the name of the Lord of hosts that mantle I've carried for years of prophetic intercession has going to fall on these people. That's going to fall upon H.I.M. Even as like City Jacobs and Lou Engle and I have been pioneers in this area, I speak over H.I.M. I speak over those who are here. I speak over the many tribes and I say, I declare there is a multiplication of the mantle and the anointing of prophetic intercession. So just receive it right now by faith. The mantle of prophetic intercession to make history before the throne of God. And you too can release a declaration that the Paris Accords will go flat. And they will in Jesus' name. Number two mantle I release over you right now is prophetic writing. Who wants to have an anointing for prophetic writing? Well, do I? I got one, okay? <laughs> I, uh, I got, I mean, you think I got one. I do. I have one. I eat, live this. I breathe this. I don't know how I got it. It's because God gave it. But I've studied to show myself and prove a workman to God. I speak over you. It isn't a little dabble, do you? I just tell you it's going to be a whole gob of the anointing coming on you. For prophetic writing, apostolic writing, I tell you God's going to make some of you, you're going to have dreams that are going to be so crystal clear. Do you know how I got the name of my second book? I saw it on a cover in a dream, and I read the entire table of contents in a dream, and I read the first page of the second chapter, and I woke up from the dream, I remembered the whole thing. <laughs> That's how I get a little bit of this. I speak revelation for prophetic writing over you. Now, receive it. Because we got to go to the luncheon, all right? Yeah, you ready? But now just really receive the mantle of prophetic intercession. Receive the mantle for prophetic writing. I'm not going to quit. I have some other things, though, to move on to, okay? And now I speak prophetic discernment. Absolute prophetic discernment over your lives. I speak an increase. I speak that which God has given to me. I speak increase over your lives in Jesus' name. And now I speak the last thing. I speak an anchor for your boat. We have had purpose-driven life. We now have presence-motivated people. But we need values anchored believers. So I bless you that the Holy Spirit is going to teach you and you will discover your core values and you will be anchored in them. And when slamming, jamming happens, you are going to come through the storm and you will be a shining light and people will look to you because you are a hope ambassador and you are a person with hope solutions for such a time as this because you have an anchor to your boat in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.